imagine you're at the coffee shop with your laptop and your smartphone on the table, and you have、uh, your smartwatch and your smart glasses and a biometric、uh, bracelet, and you're working along, and all of a sudden, your eye starts twitching, your arm convulses, the table starts shaking. You just experience some combination of a localized earthquake and licking a battery. So what happened? You got a text message. <laughs> By 2018, we're predicting that we're going to go from 8 billion devices connected to the internet to 20 billion. If the experience is going to be like that, you can keep them. <laughs> At our research lab, we're building an Internet of Things development platform so that we can change our thinking from little apps into big apps. Here's another scenario. You're at work, and you're in a meeting. You get a notification on your smartphone from your car, which is in the parking lot, that says the tire pressure is low. This happens today. This is the connected car. Now you need to get air in the tire. So as you're driving home, you pull into the service station, and you go to pump up the air. Of course, it only takes quarters. So you go inside. You go to the ATM. You convince the cashier to give you quarters. You put them in the、uh, in the air compressor. It turns on digitally because it detected the quarters are in there, and now you go grab your hand tire gauge and the air pump, and you do this game back and forth where you keep trying to measure the pressure just to put enough air in. Thinking, have you ever heard of anybody dying from overfilling their tire? <laughs> and this is a shame because the tire、uh, knows how low it is because it told you、uh, through the smartphone. The air compressor is connected digitally. It would cost less than filling up my Ford Explorer to put the right electronics on the air compressor. Uh, to connect it to the internet, but that's not happening today. So these might like they might look like two different、uh, sides of the connectivity spectrum, right? In the one case we have hyper connectivity with all these wearables, and in the other we have very little connectivity among the other devices are there. But they're actually coming from the same root cause, which we frame this as: what is the diameter of the Internet of Things? That's graph theory talk.、But、what that means is the Kevin Bacon problem. Kevin Bacon is only six degrees of separation from any movie star, so that, in graph terms, is the, the diameter of all the movie stars is six.、Um, researchers have done、uh, studies on Facebook, and it turns out that everybody on Earth, well, everybody on Facebook, which is close, almost the same thing, is only 4.6 degrees of separation from from one another. In the world of these connected things,、uh, the number is much, much bigger. The air compressor is not connected at all to the tire sensor on my car, which is a problem. So, how we think of this is, we need to get the fundamental DNA right in order to be successful with the Internet of Things, and we are all experiencing this every day. For example, if you've ever posted an Instagram photo to your Twitter timeline, you are living the core part of really true Internet DNA. What happens there is, Instagram is using an API, which just allows data to flow between two systems. Instagram uses an API to send your photo. To Twitter, that's step one, the API. The second step is that you're actually in the middle, providing the authorization. You're saying yes, Twitter, please allow Instagram to post to my timeline. You wouldn't want just anyone to do that. This is the type of thing that is missing from the scenario with the tire sensor, and frankly, it's missing from the scenario with the wearable computing. So what we really want to have happen with the tire scenario is, I pull up to the gas station. When I go to pump, I get a prompt that says Marathon. Would like to talk to the General Motors or the Ford or the Mercedes API on your behalf in order to share information between the two, and I want to say yes, just like I do between Instagram and Twitter. But I don't want it to stop there. Instead of having to go get that change、uh, to put quarters in, I would like to be able to just have the same thing happen between the gas station and PayPal, so that it can pay for it. And then while I'm at it, because I, whenever I screw those little plastic things <laughs> off, the, I always lose those things. So it'd be cool if my car could actually talk to my 3D printer once I get home to say, "Yep, he lost another one. <laughs> Print that thing out." So what's interesting about this world is we, we are in a scenario where some of the oldest, biggest companies are actually getting this right, and some of our newest, youngest, nimblest companies are getting it wrong.、Um, General Motors has done a very innovative thing, where when your Chevy Volt is charging based on the utility grid. 
as a user, I can actually allow, for example, DTE Energy or other utility providers to communicate over APIs to say that I really, am, I really care about the environment. I would like to send a demand signal from the volt to the grid to only recharge this with renewable energy. I only want it to come off a solar panel or off a wind turbine. Bechtel is another gigantic old company. They built the Hoover Dam. They've done over 20,000 gigantic construction projects. For their world, the rate at which concrete cures is a very important part of their business because it's out in the open, subject to conditions, yet a whole complex supply chain, uh, supply chain depends on how quickly that concrete is curing. So they've done a brilliant job of putting sensors all over the concrete so that those sensors can talk to trucks and trucks can talk to warehouses and warehouses can talk to factories. It's brilliant stuff. And then finally, Walgreens. Walgreens has hundreds of locations all over the place. And they actually have a gigantic investment in photo printers. Does anybody remember what the photo printer is? It was, we used to go with grandma, and she would take like a thousand photos of a baseball game, and you'd wait for four hours for those things to run, off the, uh, to run off the line. Well, is that an asset or a liability now when we have so much photo sharing? Walgreens was smart enough to view that as an asset. And what they did was they created the same scenario with APIs and authorization to say, let's partner with some really cool photo apps so that instead of just posting it to Twitter and Facebook, you can also print it at a Walgreens anywhere so you can put stuff on your wall. We still have walls. <laughs> so as we, as we think about this, we see a really important shift that needs to happen, especially among, as a technologist, I can make this ask of the design community. Right now, we're, our thinking is we have one device, one app per device. But when we get these devices all in the same room, we get that very unnerving experience of four experiences simultaneously. What we need to do is shift that. We really need our designers to think about one experience that happens to be running across multiple devices for multiple vendors, but create something that's actually harmonious. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.